three years uh, in the National Guard first, and then I decided to uh, go active duty, and then I was deployed to Iraq in 2008 and 2009. People's experience can help other people. I have reason to believe that that is true, <laughs> so to the extent... <laughs> No, I definitely agree with that. You know, it's it's been a, a very interesting journey over the past 10 years. So I definitely would like people to hear about it. You said that you haven't been doing much for the last 10 years, but obviously you're working if you're on your lunch hour, correct? Yes, I have been working as a, as far as a job goes, but it almost the past 10 years has almost felt like uh, almost being like in a type of trance, almost in like an autopilot. Uh -huh. um, and it was at the the middle of last year, summer of 2018, that something changed as far as the way I viewed life and just my overall sense of, uh, I guess, a sense of consciousness changed. I had separated from Christianity at that point for a little while, and I had gone into almost like an atheistic type of state. Almost like a, I don't know how you would kind of say it, almost like it felt like a soul loss of sense, of mm -hmm. sorts, hmm. where I just didn't know who I was, I didn't know what I wanted to do, I felt like the past 10 years had been like a real waste of time, and uh, then at that point, I reverted into uh, occult studies there for a little while, and uh -huh. I started reading mythology. And when I started reading mythologies, things started to make sense as far as how life is kind of like a metaphorical process for us. Um, mm -hmm. And actually through occult studies is where I found uh, Carl Jung's name. Right. And that's when I started reading up on his stuff. And once I read the Red Book, it was very similar to what I was going through for that 10 years after getting back from the Middle East. Uh -huh. It was almost like a a weird state I was in for that, that decade. And I could relate to exactly what he went through during that time frame. Mm -hmm. I certainly had that experience as well, but, <laughs> um, but were you, were you having a visioning experience? Absolutely. I didn't ever really thought of it as, uh, as he put it, like the act of imagination. Mm -hmm. um, to me, I just thought I was a, a, a giant daydreamer per se, and I was living in a delusion, but these, these dream states would take over during the day and, you know, four or five hours would go by and, you know, it would just, uh, the time would escape me for the most part. Mm -hmm. And I never really knew what was going on. Yeah. And unfortunately, we don't have a society that tells you. And, you know, Jung was lucky because he had he was a psychiatrist when it started to happen to him. I mean, some people say that he wondered whether he was going into a psychotic state, but that may be a little bit extreme because he knew, knew that he was imagining, visioning things, but he, he was doing it for the first time consciously as a psychiatrist, I think. Uh, obviously, psychiatrists before that knew that people who were men mental institutions had lots of visions and, you know, saw things, but they didn't, you know, they didn't put it together what it really was. And he, he said that he had to keep his conscious life and his unconscious life in in awareness okay so this is something that you may not have been able to do because you didn't know this as a as a non-psychiatrist but what he would do is remind himself well I live at 228 Seestrasse I have five kids I have a wife I have patients that depend on me that sort of thing so mm -hmm. those things were in his physical world that he kept connected to and in my case when it happened to me and it happened for eight months I thought I was just writing a novel <laughs> okay mm -hmm. no, I can definitely <laughs> relate to that yeah <laughs> yeah so I wrote this novel and then when it would I couldn't stop until it was done but when it was done I stopped okay and 
and I haven't written another novel since then. But I think I could, I just haven't been moved in that direction. So you, you just thought you were a daydreamer. And Pretty much, you know, that's what I grew up, everyone always told me I had a very active imagination right from <laughs> early childhood. I could just make everything go into a state of unconsciousness, I guess you could say, and ignore pretty much everything, which really worked to my benefit at certain points and mm -hmm. as a detriment in other other points. You never told any of the any of the shrinks in the army about this, or you did? <laughs> I think a lot of them saw it firsthand anyway, because I was ultimately I was ultimately discharged in 2009 due to post traumatic stress disorder, uh -huh. um, and I think that they could see at certain points I would kind of uh, disengage from reality. Dr. Jung talked about that being the transcendent function and and the fact that you know we actually want to have a a connection with that part of ourselves because that's really uh, where the self lives, the God image lives and it's the deepest archetype in the unconscious but I think when people don't have uh, a context for it they also don't know what to do do with it and you know Dr. Jung because he was a psychiatrist he had a context for it right and he had worked yeah. in in a mental institution and so on and did you ever take drugs for it or see a psychologist about it or not um I just saw a psychologist for the basic post traumatic stress disorder as a, as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, I did go for about a year for that, and I really didn't feel like it, it went very far. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think we ever really figured out what was going on, what was the root of it, uh, not even really touched on even the basics of it. it. For me, it felt like it was almost a waste of a year. Did, did and, they ever... Uh, per they never gave me any medications. They never did, okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, okay. No. Well, actually, that's good news, but I didn't have a case of PTSD that was anything like yours, but um, I do know that I have it a little bit, okay, from Vietnam, and it's still as strong today as it ever was, And but I now know that that's what it is, and it sounds like you know that that's what it is, so basically you can draw a circle around it and say, okay, <laughs> over here, and I know what triggers me. I don't know what would trigger you. In my case, it's, it's fireworks on the 4th of July and helicopters. Mm -hmm. I, I live in Annapolis, so we have the Naval Academy right here. And so we have helicopters flying over my house very often. And when I hear a helicopter, it puts me back in Vietnam right away. I, I mean, I immediately am having flashbacks to that time. When I came back from Vietnam, you know, I had no conception that I had any sort of, even a mild case. And mine is mild. I'm not trying to emphasize that it's a powerful case but and so I had no concept that I had an issue but um, when I was out on a boat in the Niagara River the summer after after coming back and the fireworks started and boy I almost jumped over the side of that boat and uh, I could imagine yeah I was you know much more reactive about it than I thought I would be or imagined I would be and ever since then I, I really am not comfortable watching fireworks live I mean I can I can watch it on television <laughs> no problem but if I'm outside and I'm hearing the actual explosions of the fireworks it it's very troubling for me but because I know the I know those things trigger me now I just don't go to fireworks displays. I sometimes watch it on on uh, Capitol Fourth or something on the television, and I see fireworks on mm -hmm. television, and it doesn't bother me then. But in you know when it's in my vicinity, 
live than it does. And as I say, helicopters always get me also. <laughs> um, <laughs> but do you, are you able to identify things that trigger you, trigger your PTSD? Oh yeah, abs absolutely. The, the one thing that's always stressed me out right from the beginning is any sort of large cityscape, anything with tall buildings, windows. But that was a major point of uh, concern for us in the Middle East were uh, taking fire from buildings as we were going by. Um, so I pretty much, I, and I live near New York City too, I'm only a half hour uh, from New York City and I haven't been there in probably nine years, uh -huh. I'd say. I avoid that like the plague. I, I go nowhere near any sort of cityscape like that. <laughs> I see. Just too much well, going on. Well, that's, that's good. I mean, in a sense, you're blessed to know what the issue is for you in, in that respect. Mm -hmm. and at the same time, the fact that you're able to hold a job and such, uh, that's a good sign, it uh, sounds like, because at least you're you're able to you know, interact with society in some way. What are, what are you doing now? Um, I work as a, a welder and a fabricator. Uh -huh. Okay, so well, that, the nice part about the job is, is I can pretty much go into my own little corner and, and uh, not really be disturbed all too much. Right, yeah. That's, that, uh, that sounds useful, and also you're being creative uh, when you're doing that. I mean, there's mm -hmm. certain cre creativity yep involved in being a welder and pulling things together and that sort of thing i'm sure and so that that can be very satisfying and what is it about what you've listened to me because i've had i've had a number of people say to me that i was the first guy that they had listened to who who uh, helped them, and and so you you came to me, and I'm just curious what the where the impulse came from, and so on. I mean, I'm very glad that it happened, but I I just w I'm curious about it. Well, I really once I started delving into the Jungian psychology and reading the books and everything, you know, I didn't understand everything I was reading. Yes. Um, it, it's definitely tough. Man and his symbols was probably the easiest for me to understand, but the way you explained everything was really easy, and it, it, it uh, clicked real well in my head, and it brought it to a level that I could definitely take in the information and, and use it on a practical level. I see, yeah. I mean, young is not easy, but what I've found for myself is that, you know, little by little, I've sort of gotten it. <laughs> I've understood it, number one. And number two, it, and I've never studied it in, in a formal class per se. I mean, I have gone to the Young Society a couple of times, but I don't find them that helpful. But what I found was that after I read Dr. Young's work, it balances me. It makes me feel like I've had a some psychotherapy and so if I get myself all upset about something and you know there are plenty of things to be upset about in life if if I just pick up anything by Dr. Jung and just start reading it it calms me down right away and I think that's partially because I know more and more about what his overall work is so it just plugs me into that level Dr. Ann Ulanoff wrote a book called uh, The Psychoid and the Soul, I think. And in that book, she described how psychotherapy works from her point of view. And she's a, uh, she was a professor of psychiatry and religion at Union Theological Seminary, believe it or not. I never imagined that there would ever, <laughs> I never imagined anybody who would have that combination of, of specialty, <laughs> but she did have, uh, she's retired now, but uh, she's written quite a number of books. And, you know, one of the things is, uh, I don't remember the details, but one of the things is that just uh, talking to someone else as we're doing now can be very therapeutic 
but then she also talks about going into another layer of the psyche. And I'm not a psychotherapist and I'm not a mental health professional, so I don't propose to do that per se, but I can describe what it is, which is you're in a conversation and everything else seems to go away and you're just focused on that conversation. And you both both parties are uh, enter this what she would call I guess the psychoid layer where there's an interchange, a sharing. And it is therapeutic for both parties, but of course the psychotherapist knows what's going on and the and the client doesn't. Now in yeah. my case, because I'm not trained and I, I don't want to get into that, I um I I don't intentionally go go into that space, but I think it's also very much just like a good conversation, like when you have a conversation with some person and you know, you're in a, a special psychological space with that person. So when I'm sort of describing the things that trigger me and PTSD, um, you as a as a former military person would have experiences so that you can imagine yourself in my position and I can imagine myself in your position uh, because of, you know, I obviously had training about uh, urban warfare uh, while I was in the Marine. You know, we sort of enter into a space that only we know about, and and there's a there's an exchange. There's there's the verbal exchange that we're having where we're having a conversation, but there's also an unconscious exchange of empathy or something like that. I guess you would say, but uh, it's it's useful. I guess one of the things I wanted to chat about or understand your situation is you do you have a family or you uh, you have a wife or kids or anything like that i do have a wife uh we've been together since uh 19 years old actually so even even before my uh my husband into the military uh -huh. um so we've been together it'll be 16 years this year uh -huh. um, no children as of yet. She's still uh, heavily involved in her career path. Once we uh, settle down a little bit more, we'll we'll tackle the uh, obstacle of children. And uh, uh, the good thing was is she was always very good with the military lifestyle because her father's a, a Vietnam veteran also. I see. Um, so he was in the uh, Navy <clears throat> SEAL. I see. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, that's a, that's good to know, and it's also very helpful to have a have a spouse uh, because that helps us with our wholeness uh, that's an idea that most people don't understand but you know that's what a marriage is really about is uh, bringing out the inferior side of our psyche so that um, you know if if we're very strongly one way hopefully our spouse brings what we don't have in our psyche in to help us and um, you know it's the way I explain it is if you imagine the yin-yang symbol one side is white and one side is black and they don't mix in other words that that symbol is a circling symbol and it and it's always uh, developing and also going away. So if if you start to go one way, she's going to start to go the other type yep, of thing, yep, right? Yep. So the the classic joke, which I actually have on a mug I picked up in Arizona, was uh, if a man speaks in the desert and no woman hears him, is he still wrong? And <laughs> and so you know. Your shadow side makes you giggle about that, but the reality is that uh, yes, you are <laughs> okay because yep. because you you don't you don't bring to the party the things that 
that your spouse does and mm -hmm. so it's a matter of wholeness okay to be mm -hmm. to be complete in your psychological approach to the world you you need a partner usually that's between a man and a, and a woman so it's uh, it sounds very healthy that you have a have a wife and uh, you sound uh, positive about that so that's a good sign um, well we definitely do complete each other uh, there uh, what you're talking about that wholeness is definitely uh, something I've noticed over the past 15 16 years um, especially when I came home because in my earlier years when I was in the military prior to serving in combat I was a little bit I guess you could say more of a confident personality and took charge more often. Mm -hmm. And when I came home and I, I uh, kind of spun into a whirlwind of uh, depression there for a while, the role switched uh -huh. where I became a little bit more docile and a little bit, I needed to be pushed in order to get stuff done at that point. And she took on that role um, while I was in that state. And now we're starting to swing back the other way. Now where things are starting to balance out again. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I definitely, I definitely see that connection there. Well, that's uh, you know the the key to it is to uh, uh, keep working with your spouse on these things because they're always changing. And you know, I'm on my second marriage, and it we came to a point in my first marriage where I just couldn't get my wife to understand my needs and mm -hmm. and uh, sh and I didn't know anything about psychology at the time so I didn't have any tools to solve the problem and um, you know f fortunately now I have gone through all this uh, Jungian psychology work and so I'm familiar with the with uh, the fact that you have to complete one another, and it's an ongoing process, and and uh, and you'll you'll both change during life, and and so you know as those transformations come, you have to be uh, respectful of those, and and see how they they may change you, push you around the circle too, um, and. Uh, you know, it's, sometimes it's challenging. You know, I I was just joking a little while ago that um, my wife is is uh, a J person, a judge, judging person, and I'm a perceiving person. So, um, mm -hmm. so she wants to have everything in the dishwasher just so, and so if I'm lo loading the dishwasher. Um, you know, she won't be satisfied, and and she'll start to move dishes around in the dishwasher, and and I respond like uh, the Fonz from uh, All in the Family. Hey, okay, you know, you do it your way. You know, I, I don't care. <laughs> it's all right by me. Yep, let it go. Let some things go. <laughs> yeah, um, and um, and so it's you know, it's good that we have that that difference because it serves us in some ways and you know the traditional marriage counseling idea from the Myers-Briggs test is that uh, you ought to have two or three of the characteristics the same but if you have them all different a hundred percent different um, there's too much conflict and if you have them all the same it's too boring in your marriage mm -hmm. and and so it's good to have one or two of them the same and I, are you familiar with the Myers-Briggs test? Uh, that's uh, uh, it's the test that they use to identify uh, personality traits and uh, yeah yeah okay I thought so yeah yeah so you probably have never taken it and probably don't know much about it um, but I'm gonna put it on the chat here so that you can remember there are if you put that name into Google or something like that bring up a test you can take an online test for nothing it, it's not the complete 
Myers-Briggs test, but it's enough to get a sense of what your psychological types are. And uh, basically the way it works is there's four uh, scales and you fit somewhere on that scale and it's not it's never completely the extreme or almost never so if you and your wife both take it then you'll be able to see whether you're the same of the 16 personality types or whether you have something different and and that's good to know because it's it's helpful to understand that this is a personality trait you know my you know if i can imagine some husbands who are maybe also J might get very irritated at their wife for insisting that things have to go together this way in the dishwasher, you know, and, <laughs> and so if I were that way and I, and I was, I was filling the dishwasher and my wife says, no, no, you got to do it this way. No, no, you got to do it this way. You can imagine how that can get very irritating very quickly. So we're lucky in that way because we complement each other, and I don't mind if my wife does that. <laughs> you, know? you know, in terms of uh, going forward, I, you know, we, I think we have to, we have to think about what's next. Okay, we never. I don't think we can plan our lives perfectly. Unfortunately, I've planned my life in a lots lots of different ways and I've gone to huge goals goals like becoming an attorney becoming an MBA founding a public company I founded a public company but in most cases I was sort of forced to do each one of those things I mean when I finished college I didn't think that I was going to ever be a lawyer I'd never thought about going to graduate school but when I was in Vietnam, for the last three months of it, I was bunked with three lawyers. <laughs> and they basically recruited me. <laughs> you know, one of them was the chief trial counsel of, of the 1st Marine Division, and one was the chief defense counsel, so they were always at each other's throats, and one of them was, was the military judge. <laughs> And so they were always talking law around me. So then I decided to apply for law school after that. It was, it was an interesting experience. But the point is, I went to law school. I put eight years into going to law school and practicing law for five years. And then I said, wow, I really detest this profession. I really don't like it because I'm always dealing with other people's hardships. I don't want to do that. And as I see people that are involved in psychology, I say, wow, I wouldn't want to do that either, where people have, um, are hurting. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to sit in a, in a room all day and have eight different patients come in and <laughs> tell me their troubles. The reason especially that I'm interested in talking to you is simply because you're a veteran and I take special note of veterans. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, it's much appreciated. Thank yeah. you. Tell me what, if anything, I can do or how I can help in any way. I mean, I, I, once again, I'm not a mental health professional, so I'm not asking you to pay me anything for this conversation. This is a conversation between two fellow veterans, that's it. Um, but, you know, I might be able to offer some help, some wisdom that might be useful to you. The one thing that I like, uh, that I want to do eventually is I, I want to take the Jungian psychology to veterans in particular, and I think this is something you could agree with as well, that it is much more helpful um, right. than the current system. Um, the system that they have now, I, I, you know, just this year alone, I've had three uh, fellow service members I was in the war with kill themselves. Yeah, um, that's very troubling to me too. I, you know, I've seen, I've seen that a lot. I'm certainly happy to try to find a way to help people uh, like that because 
you know, there there is a reason for living. And, you know, there is, uh, from my point of view, there is something that drives us unconsciously. You know, Dr. Jung and Dr. Edinger talked about that being the God image or the greater personality. And so, you know, the reason I'm here and you and I are talking is because my self, my greater personality uh, is pushing me in that direction. I just happen to have on my desk, this is a diagram of the psyche that Dr. Edward Edinger uh, had did. And so here's our conscious mind up here, and this mm -hmm. is all of our inferior thoughts, which are our shadow, okay, the okay. shadow side. And then at the lower side is the self, the God image. And so that part is really the thing that drives us. and tells us we need to be doing something else. We've been through crises in our lives, whatever it is. Obviously, you've survived being deployed in the military, so you have a strong enough ego to face mm -hmm. these things. And so this, this archetype pushes through and, and tells us to do something, okay? And sometimes that's good and sometimes it's bad. And so the key, and you know, this is even in the Bible, that you have to test the spirits. And the point is that that part of us that's deep down in our psyche, our deepest archetype in the, in the psyche, is what Jung called the two million year old man, or it, it's actually the 3.5 billion year old man, because it's, it's that part of us that keeps not, kept not only us alive when we were deployed, but also has kept all of our ancestors alive at least long enough to reproduce, going back all the way to single-celled or organisms. Okay, so we're, we're all the result of some grandparent go, going long back before humans even existed who have okay. successfully re reproduced to today, okay? And so all of those ancestors going all the way back to single-celled organisms okay. have successfully reproduced to create us. And that's, that's pushed by the spirit, the spirit that uh, brings us our spouse, for example, and uh, causes us ultimately to reproduce ourselves, is we don't know where that spirit is going, okay? And until about four million years ago, until humanity uh, developed, that spirit was unconscious, okay? It, it was aware, it was, it was uh, instinctual, but it, uh, it wasn't able to think abstractly as human beings do today. And so that, that self is the part of us that keeps us alive in many ways, okay? But it also brings up negative ideas. It brings up good ideas and bad ideas, okay? And so the key is that you have a strong enough ego so that you can decide because you have to live in the 21st century yourself your this three and a half billion year old man that's within you uh, which is all your instincts and so on um, you know that model was that that model was finalized the day you were born okay and so you you got that edition of the human model the day you were born and and that hasn't changed since then and that model is still alive in you and it produces I ideas both good and bad and but the point is that you have to live in the 21st century that instinctual self doesn't have to okay didn't have to and never did but anyway you need to look to yourself to you know, decide what's 
right and what's wrong for you and that you have to do in your conscious mind in your ego mind and you may have an urge and and so most people don't have connection with that self okay and that's what's called the transcendent function but someone like you who's having mythological visioning experiences uh, that means you do have a connection to it and so you know your psyche is trying to tell you something through those visions and it's it's not a bad idea to reflect on what it's trying to tell you it may be telling you something negative because it's it's typically compensatory in other words wherever you are it's giving you the opposite okay and so when i was at age 40 i was unemployed and i was having all these execution dreams okay and so the executions were by firing squad by electric chair by uh, <laughs> lethal injection whatever way you could kill somebody i was having a dream and i was the i was the uh person in that dream but i the I was never actually executed, but I was, you know, taken up to be hanged or whatever it was. You know, that was my psyche as a compensatory matter saying, man, you're not living the way you should be living. You're, you know, you should be doing something in a profession right now. Mm -hmm. And, and if you don't get something going in your profession, you're going to be, uh, you're, you're just going to die. Okay. So that's, my psyche telling me you know get a job <laughs> okay <laughs> and it's not telling me i should i should commit suicide it's yeah. telling me this isn't good and you know and i'm i'm saying because i knew know something about Jungian psychology i am saying, tell me something i don't know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> obviously i needed to get a job but i didn't have one and and so um, I was having those dreams, and I, I don't, I haven't been having those dreams ever since because you know my my life did go on, and I had a, a long run of professional success, especially in business. But you know your psyche is is balancing. Okay, the the idea is that um, everything is is an opposite in the in your psyche and that's where psychic energy comes from mm -hmm. is moving between the those opposites and so if you get too far out on one side your dreams and visions are going to st start to try to pull you back to the other side and we we have th actually thousands of them so you can't predict what your dreams are going to be because you're two million year old man or your three and a half billion year old man is responding instinctually to what you need right now okay mm. and so the vision that you had a year ago or five years ago whatever isn't talking about your life today typically these things are uh, communi trying to communicate something uh, that it thinks you need right now okay, okay. and and so you know you, you shouldn't necessarily think of it as telling you something about five years for, ago or five years from now it's really um, it, as I understand it now this is you know where I have to repeat that I'm not a mental health professional that um, you but that's the way I think about it and and um, but I pay attention okay because uh, the vision that I often get is of a police car that's going from right to left across in front of me and it's got uh, the word police on the side of the car and whenever I have that vision I slow down and pay attention because within one to two minutes I will see police activity it can be a speed trap but it can be any other police activity too it can be an accident or something like that but whenever I have that vision or whenever I think of the police um, I know that something is happening and I pay attention to that 
and uh, it never fails that that uh, when that happens I know something's going on and I have to be aware of it and what this is in my opinion okay and I've thought about this a lot is that my unconscious is responding to things that I haven't noticed in my conscious mind mm -hmm. for example the speed of oncoming traffic will change subtly you know it'll change maybe five or ten miles an hour you see that you're not you're not converging quite as fast as you were before and whenever my unconscious perceives that fact it tells me it gives me this <laughs> police vision and within a minute or two there there will be a speed trap so I never I don't need a, a radar detector I know I just know I know when I have that vision I know that that's what it means and and so I I'm intuitive about that fact it's not that everybody can have that happen but yeah. you know but that's my instinctual three and a half billion year old man saying there's a predator okay and not that police are predators but that's how my uh, unconscious is reacting to mm -hmm. what the police force does when it pulls you over for speeding right <laughs> <laughs> absolutely i did plenty of that <laughs> yeah so that's how it comes up for me but you know you seem to have a fairly good connection with that but and so then the question is okay what are those visions about and where you know what is your three and a half billion year old man trying to tell you um, by by that vision today one thing to do is just write them down and then reflect on them and and that's basically as as I understand it that's basically what a psychotherapist will do and mm -hmm. a psychotherapist will ask you to reflect on it and and it's what it means to you it's not you know, everybody is different so they can't predict what any image means I mean I have right here I have this whole book of symbols right that, is, that actually was written by Jungian analysts if you read it okay it's it's very rich in suggesting what these various symbols mean but they actually don't mean anything to your life per se because uh, it can be entirely different and uh, for example I had a um, I, I jokingly read the read the definition of knee or the symbol of me from this book um, to my group one time and I had uh, I had told them a dream and the dream was that the group was together and we were all getting in a white limousine together we were very happy together and so on but somebody says where's Albert and uh, so I get out and take a look around the parking lot where's Albert and here's Albert over in a dark corner of the parking lot getting taken away by Nazis in a dark truck okay and so it's Nazis who are you know wearing Nazi style uniforms and they're putting Albert in the truck and it turns out that uh, and Albert calls out of the truck uh, save me and my interpretation of that dream was that Albert was my knee and I had just within the last week been told that I had to have a knee replacement and so I was obviously quite upset about the fact that I was going to have to have this surgery and and the the Nazis were the the doctors who were actually going to replace my <laughs> knee and Albert represented my knee but in this book of symbols nobody ever mentioned that that uh, my knee could be, could represent uh, or a, a dream like that could represent my knee but that's what it was I know that that's what it was and you know because I know what my 
my emotional state was at that time and that sort of thing. And and so we have a joke in the in my local group where people say, how's Albert, or how's Albert doing today, and so on. Of course, Albert's long gone because I had this knee replacement a couple of years mm-hmm. back, but, you know, we still talk about that. Yeah. I don't know, is this conversation helping you in any way? or? Oh, yeah, it's definitely, it, it's helping me realize some of the things I've noticed about myself also with uh, just listening to the these visions and listening to the dreams, because just within the past uh, couple months, I started doing a dream analysis book. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just started writing down every dream that I've had. And the dreams have even changed since I started doing that. It's almost like, okay, now that you're listening, now we can start addressing the situation that's at hand, because the dreams are really very strange and almost desperate in a certain sense, like trying to get my attention, like, hey, listen, you know, these aren't just visions you're seeing, I'm trying to get your attention so we can move forward. You know, once I started uh, writing down the dreams, reading them over later, especially like a few weeks later, a few days later, I started to notice that there's like a theme that goes on. Right. And actually multiple themes at the same time. There's probably like four or five different themes that address certain issues. Mm-hmm. Um, and each one of the characters in the dream is different to a certain extent. Right. Um, and I've definitely found that that's been very helpful. Um, and I can even see about how uh, when I delved into mythology in the past, it helped me understand some of these metaphors like you were just talking about with uh, Albert representing me. You know, it's like the unconscious communicates to us in a, a language we don't always understand. Sure. But there are clues for us in there to start going over and listening to it. Right, because we think in images. You know, the imaging function of the brain developed long, long before we ever had language or the ability to read and write. And so our psyche wants to communicate something to us and it takes from our experience that's in our memory and it chooses images that are meaningful to us to try to to say something so for example albert being taken away by the nazis okay well okay i understand this is uh, my knee not wanting to be <laughs> ground down and replaced um, and yep. and the nazis were the surgeons but you know they're they're actually not nazis they're very fine men but but this is how mm-hmm. my my psyche expresses that to me let's say oh yeah and yep. And so it's very useful to keep a dream journal. I keep one. Um, I don't often, I don't always have a big dream like that, but sometimes I do. And sometimes I I found that I can let the dream keep going into an act of imagination and just stay relaxed or in one case, and I haven't done active imagination much since I wrote my novel, but one time I had a a big dream and I wanted to see what would happen next and so I just a couple of hours later I was remembering I just would remember the dream and then I just let the scenario flow and my imagination presented the next part of the story the next chapter of the story if you will that was going to come up in the dream but hadn't yet in the dream and so I just let it emerge while I was physically conscious, and that was useful, too. So I think that novelists write from active imagination, basically, and, and when they say they have writer's block, it means that there's a blockage between their unconscious. They're not getting this flow of ideas coming from their unconscious, but it doesn't sound to me like you have that problem and so you know if you wanted to start writing for example uh, you could you know let your imagination flow and and see what happened you know think of a story Uh, you know Michael Crichton pardon (laughs) 
I've often thought of writing too. It's because uh, there's so many ideas that bounce around your head during those active imagination. Sure. Uh, so, you know, it's be overwhelming sometimes. <clears throat> yeah. So Michael Creighton was asked, "How do you, how do you write a novel?" And he said, "Well, the way to not write a novel is uh, to ask a question and then answer it." And so when I wrote my novel, I. I had a question that I had all my life from my father, which was, uh, he, we were living in Japan, he was a naval officer, and we had a live-in maid, and I said, you know, how does Michiko come to us to be a live-in maid? And he said, well, uh, Japanese farm girls come to Tokyo to earn their dowry, and so that was all he said, and he said that to me when I was 15. My unconscious was working, working, working on this comment of his 30 years, 31 years. And then when I wanted to write a novel, I thought of that, it, that statement that he made. And so I said, okay, so what would it be like if a woman like that f developed into being the first woman prime minister of Japan? So that was my question. What would it be like for this woman who's come to earn her dowry and who becomes the first woman prime minister of Japan? What would her life have been like? And so that's what my novel is. And so that was the question, and I just filled it in. But I, it flowed from my unconscious entirely, the answers did. So it's quite possible to do that. and. I think great novelists who can't make that connection, then they feel they have writer's block. But it, the same applies for artists who, you know, paint pictures and that sort of thing. So it, you don't have to do it as, as writing. You can do it as a novel, you can do it or as a painting, you can do it uh, in ballet if you want, in choreography or whatever, but uh, you can do it in woodworking. Okay, and one way to connect is to go to, uh, you know, for a man, it would be go to the Sears tool, tool department and just see which tool attracts your attention. And you should probably do something with that tool, whatever it is, a circular saw or a drill or whatever it is, and uh, imagine the most beautiful thing you can make with that tool. Or another choice would be... Um, Go to the art supply store and just see what what of the art supplies uh, appeals to you. Okay, and whatever that is, whether it's you know uh, paints or colored pencils or you name it, that can be yourself manifesting or wanting to manifest through that material. And so that's a way to connect up with the with the unconscious and with uh, with the self, which I was showing you in this picture, right? So, mm -hmm. and you want to know what that that's telling you. I mean, basically, that's the rule. So, if you can make that connection, it's a terrific thing to do in your life, I think. That's what I want to write down, like a list of things that we can address as far as veterans go. Okay, and that'd be great. Like do a whole segment on that, so that way we can address that, because I really. That's something I really want to get a message across, especially to the, with the numbers of suicides going up and up and up. It's, right. It's, okay. Well, let, let's do that. I, I would be very, very interested in doing that. I, I, too, like you, am very worried about losing so many veterans. I think we're losing 20 to 22 a day uh, from suicide. And, oh, yeah. And... Uh, you know that that's just not right and it's not right that our government hasn't figured out an answer for that um, and um, so I think if we do some thinking about it and talking about it you may stimulate some ideas I have and, and we can you know we can help other people think about these things a bit so anyway uh, yep, Craig, to me. Great to talk to you. Let's uh, do it again when you're ready. Uh, send me an email when you're ready, and I will uh, send right. you. A, I will send you a link to this Dropbox once I get this video put over in the Dropbox, 
and then you can watch the video okay. watch the video again and you know some very often what I find is when I participate in something like this it's coming from myself and so my conscious mind isn't necessarily engaged my ego mind isn't engaged and so when I re-listen to a video I'm saying, oh, okay, that was pretty good what I said there, you know, whatever, or that was interesting. So it's useful to re replay them later on. So anyway, nice chatting with you. I'll talk to you again soon. I don't want to keep you from you work. You too, Have a good weekend. Yeah, take care now. Bye-bye.